wild advertisement appeared. If any of you guys need a legit website for your tech YouTube channel, blog, or whatever, the .tech squad is offering $5.tech domains until April 8th with the code AWESOMESAUCE. This is a new initiative, so many domain names haven't been taken yet. That's why I was able to score AWESOMESAUCE.tech before any of you guys could snag it first and try selling it to me later. Trolls. Go check it out. I put a link in the description. Okay, bye. What's up, guys? So back in January, I loaded up my car full of gear and drove out to Las Vegas, Nevada to cover CES 2016. Among the essentials was my sleeper PC, which served as my editing machine for all my event coverage. And while I had no problems hauling it around in my rickety hatchback, the rig isn't quite portable enough to join me on upcoming events that I'll be traveling to by plane. On the agenda is Computex in Taipei and the fast approaching Land Syndicate in Seattle, hosted by my friends over at Tech Syndicate. Speaking of which, I am super pumped to see some of you guys there and I'll put a link in the description for those of you interested in joining us for a weekend of gaming and craft beer debauchery. So in order to kick both of these events in the balls, today I'm building a high-end machine that's small enough to fit in my carry-on bag. That's why I'm dubbing today's build the Go Anywhere Do Anything PC, which is really misleading if you think about it, but pay that no mind! What's important to note here, ladies and gentlemen, is that the rig is designed around flexibility on the go, so whether it be gaming, editing, or streaming, I'm equipped to handle any number of use case scenarios, with above average performance at that. On that note, let's dive into the parts that we'll be using for my new traveling companion, starting with the Node 202 from Fractal Design. I tend to think of this mini ITX case as being in an office or an HTPC environment, but its slim profile makes it a prime choice for computing abroad as well. The chassis features front panel USB 3, thoughtful ventilation for the core components, and Fractal's Integra 450 watt SFX power supply, which has an 80 plus bronze certification. It seems the only part of this case I won't be taking full advantage of is its generous GPU clearance, but not without good reason. Up until this point I've only read articles and seen videos of this petite powerhouse, but I've hoped for some time now that the AMD R9 Nano would make its way into one of my builds eventually. This reference Fiji based offering from PowerColor is a mini ITX builder's wet dream, and I can't think of a better video card for today's build. 4 gigs of HBM, DirectX 12 support, and killer performance are packaged inside the card's adorable 6 inch cooler, which almost looks disproportionate in the Node 202's large GPU chamber. But screw it, I'll gladly take the extra breathing room, cable management space, and overall lighter build when traveling. Another quality that makes the R9 Nano a great choice here is performance per watt. While it's fast enough to max out pretty much any game at Quad HD, the 175 watt TDP is well within the capabilities of our 450 watt power supply with additional room for overclocking, not to mention the single 8 pin PCIe connector will help alleviate cable clutter. Our CPU of choice is the Intel Skylake Core i7-6700K that I'll be pairing with the NH-L9i cooler from Noctua. Let me be the first to point out here that a locked processor might have been a wiser choice, since not much overclocking can be done with this cooler despite its reputation for being a great low profile performer. That being said, I already had a 6700K on hand, so by golly, I'm gonna use it. With limited overclocking potential, raw power and hyper-threading are really the key benefits of this quad-core chip that will aid immensely in my gaming and editing workloads. For RAM, we have a 16GB kit of HyperX Savage DDR4 at 1866, which will populate this stunning mini-ITX motherboard from MSI, the Z170i Gaming Pro AC. Now again, the OC capabilities of the Z170 chipset here might be a moot point with our CPU cooler, but beyond the scope of overclocking, this board comes packed full of features like Intel Gigabit LAN, USB 3.1 connectivity up the wazoo, and built-in 802.11ac Wi-Fi. I can also appreciate a good onboard sound chip and the gorgeously fierce aesthetic, making this one of the sexiest Z170 boards at this form factor. The feature I'm most excited to use on this bad boy, however, is the PCIe Gen 3 x4 M.2 SSD slot with Samsung's 512 gig NVMe 950 Pro. The vertical NAND in this drive is some of the fastest currently available at the consumer level, and the insane sequential reads and writes this drive hits with incompressible data will do wonders for video editing in Adobe Premiere. For games, media, and just about everything else that isn't raw footage waiting to be edited, I'll be using a 960 gig HyperX Savage. This SSD was formerly installed in Hotline until I realized I hadn't written anything to the drive in months, so it's about time we get some mileage out of it. With the 950 Pro, this gives the system around 1.5 terabytes of solid state storage, which I'm feeling pretty good about. So that wraps up our list of hardware, and I've put links to all the things in the description below. Now if you don't mind, it's time for me to strip these parts of their packaging and procreate some ones and zeros. Don't worry, you can watch.
Alright, the build is complete and looking good, I might add, but I did have to spend a lot of time getting those cables nice and tidy. Like most mini ITX cases that are designed for portability, cable management in the Node 202 was about as graceful as a car crash, and midway through the build I realized I had forgot to install the 950 Pro into the M.2 slot behind the motherboard. Fortunately, the case has a huge CPU cutout where I was able to mount the drive without undoing the cables and motherboard, easily saving me half an hour of build time. Something to bear in mind is that the PCI riser card should be installed before the CPU cooler and memory if you hope to thread all three of the mounting screws. I ended up only mounting two of the screws because I refused to reinstall the CPU cooler, so this rig should be falling apart any minute now. Overall, this was a challenging build given the small form factor, but the end result certainly makes it all worthwhile. Make sure to stay tuned for part two of this video where I test thermals, acoustics, and gaming performance. Until then, let me know what you guys think of this rig in the comments below, and don't forget to toss me a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Before you go, check the description for new extra soft CPU cooler shirts, which are rocking a brand new material and feature next level hyper threading. Also, feel free to bookmark my Amazon affiliate link down there and use it when you buy stuff. As always, I'm Kyle with Awesome Sales Network. Thank you guys for watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I'll see y'all in the next video.